Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is inrush current. Our objective is to learn to calculate inrush current using the data available on the motor nameplate, as well as discuss the electrical theory explaining inrush current. As you're no doubt aware, a motor at rest experiences a momentary surge of current known as inrush, starting current, or locked rotor current, when energized by full voltage. Inrush current may be about six times rated current, although in this lecture, we'll learn to calculate it more precisely. As the motor comes up to the rated speed, current will drop to the rated value. Full voltage, sometimes called direct online or across the line motor starters, must be designed to make inrush current. Inrush at times is an unwanted phenomenon that may affect the performance of other electrical devices in the same distribution system. If you've ever experienced the lights dim in an old kitchen upon starting up a blender or a vacuum cleaner, this is the result of inrush. For this reason, reduced voltage starting techniques like primary resistor reduced voltage starters, part winding reduced voltage starters, y start delta run reduced voltage starters, and soft starters, among other techniques, are employed to reduce inrush current and mitigate its negative effects. Lacking these techniques, a technician must at times calculate the anticipated inrush using the information available on the motor nameplate. This way, wire size and instantaneous demand in the electrical distribution system can be predicted in advance. Recall in the motor nameplates lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, we briefly examined some of the locked rotor code entries on the motor nameplate. Let's take a closer look at this entry and try some additional illustrated examples. The locked rotor code, sometimes they call the kilovolt ampere per horsepower constant, is a letter that represents a range of numerical values. These numerical values, along with power and voltage data, are then entered into a formula to calculate the anticipated inrush. The formula for a three-phase AC motor demonstrates that inrush is the code number times the power in units of horsepower divided by the rated voltage times 577. Note the placement of the parentheses for hard-headed individuals that wish to enter this formula into their calculator in one pass. As illustrated in the table, each letter is a lower and upper numerical bound. Depending upon the application, you may wish to perform the calculation twice, potentially three times, to determine the minimum anticipated inrush, the maximum anticipated rush, and the average anticipated inrush. You'll note the letters in the lock rotor code table go from A to V and do not include the letters I, O, and Q as these letters might be easily confused for other data and entry headings in the motor nameplate. Consider a quarter horsepower motor. Intended to operate using 208 volt three phase AC in the low voltage configuration with a locked rotor code of M, meaning it has a kilovolt ampere per horsepower constant with a low of 10 up to a high of 11.19. Center of mass would be the average of these two numbers at 10.6. You note the rated current of this motor operated at 208 volts is 1.3 amps. If we wanted a quick rough estimate of inrush, we could say we might expect a momentary surge of 6 times 1.3 amps, or roughly 7.8 amps, and call it good. However, as you'll soon learn, this rough estimate isn't exactly accurate. Let's calculate the lowest, average, and highest amount of inrush we might expect to observe. At the low end, M equals 10. Substituting this value, the power rating in horsepower, and the rate of voltage into the inrush equation results in a lower bound of roughly 6.9 amps. In the middle, M equals roughly 10.6. Substituting this value, the power rating in units of horsepower, and the rated voltage into the inrush equation results in a middle estimate of roughly 7.3 amps. Finally, at the upper end, M equals roughly 11.2. Substituting this value, the power rating in units of horsepower, and the rated voltage into the inrush equation results in an upper bound of roughly 7.8 amps. There you have it. We might therefore expect this motor to experience an inrush of roughly 6.9 amps to 7.8 amps. This is a far more precise estimate than the six times rated current shortcut, but illustrates the shortcut isn't that bad for this particular system. This isn't always the case for motors designed to drive high torque loads like positive displacement pumps or fully loaded or inclined conveyor belts. Consider a one horsepower motor intended to operate using 230 volt three phase AC in the low voltage configuration with a locked rotor code of P, meaning it has a kilovolt ampere per horsepower constant with a low of 12.5 up to a high of around 14. Center of mass would be the average of these two numbers at around 13.25. You note the rated current of this motor operated in the low voltage configuration at 330 volts is 3 amps. You'd think we'd be able to estimate inrush at roughly 6 times 3 amps, or 18 amps, and call it good. However, this is far from the truth. At the low end, P equals 12.5. Substituting this value, the power rating needs of horsepower, and the rated voltage into the inrush equation results in a lower bound of roughly 31.4 amps. In the middle, P equals approximately 13.25. Substituting this value, the power rating units of horsepower, and the rate of voltage into the inrush equation 
results in middle estimate of roughly 33.2 amps. At the upper end, P equals around 14. Substituting this value, the power rating in units of horsepower and the rate of voltage into the inrush equation results in an upper bound of roughly 35.1 amps. We might therefore expect this motor to experience an inrush of roughly 31.4 amps to 35.1 amps. Way more than the six times rated current shortcut suggests, illustrating the shortcut is quick, but it isn't always accurate for all applications. All right, before we move on to the electrical theory describing inrush, let's put your knowledge of calculating inrush to the test with these two illustrated examples. Given the data in the motor nameplates and the kilovolt ampere per horsepower constant table, see if you can calculate the anticipated average inrush for these two motors when placed in the specific voltage configuration. For both scenarios, let's use the center of mass or average of the kilovolt ampere per horsepower constant. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The first example features a three horsepower motor intended to operate using 208 volt three phase AC in the low voltage configuration with a locked rotor code of K, meaning as a kilovolt ampere per horsepower constant with a low of eight up to a high of around nine. Center of mass would be the average of these two numbers at around 8.5. Substituting this value, the power rating in units of horsepower and the rated voltage into the inrush equation results in an estimate of roughly 70.7 .7 amps. You'll note this is roughly 8.1 times the rated current of 8.7 amps when in the low voltage configuration. The second example features a super beefy 15 horsepower motor intended to operate using 460 volt three phase AC in the high voltage configuration with a locked rotor code of G, meaning as a kilovolt ampere per horsepower constant with a low of 5.6 up to a high of around 6.3. Center of mass would be the average of these two numbers at around 5.95. Substituting this value, the power rating in units of horsepower and the rate of voltage into the equation results in an estimate of roughly 112 amps. As astronomically large as this value is, you note this is only roughly 5.7 times the rate of current of 19.5 amps when operated in the high voltage configuration. As these examples were intended to illustrate, the six times rated current shortcut is just a rough estimate and motors can and do exhibit wide ranges of inrush in relation to rated current, sometimes more than six times, sometimes less. Those motors with a kilovolt ampere per horsepower constant at the upper end of the alphabet, nearer to A, exhibit less inrush than would a similarly rated motor with a kilovolt ampere per horsepower constant in the lower depths of the alphabet, nearest to V. Additionally, these examples illustrated that inrush, although brief, can put a tremendous strain on the electrical distribution system that must be anticipated in advance. Oftentimes, generators or off-grid battery-based inverters specify two ratings. One, a rated current capable of being met on a nearly continuous basis, and two, a maximum surge current that the system is capable of temporarily meeting. Consider a motor anticipated to draw two amps at the rated conditions. If we use the six times shortcut, we might expect this motor to briefly experience an inrush surge of 12 amps. If we used a generator with a rated current of three amps and a permitted maximum surge current of nine amps, it might run the motor, but it wouldn't start it without difficulty or without the use of a reduced voltage starter. Lastly, before we start discussing the theory behind inrush, it should be noted that some motor manufacturers take it upon themselves to perform inrush calculations in advance and explicitly state the expected inrush right on the motor nameplate. As you are no doubt aware, the entry FLA on a motor nameplate stands for full load amperes. That's another way of stating rated current, meaning it is the current drawn per phase when the motor is producing its rated mechanical power output. If you ever see the entry LRA, this is the inrush current where LRA stands for locked rotor amperes, meaning this is the magnitude of the momentary surge of current drawn per phase when the rotor is locked or in the at rest condition and the motor is suddenly energized by full voltage. The LRA entry in the motor nameplate saves you the trouble of performing inrush calculations yourself. All right, let's now discuss the theory behind inrush. Fair warning, this half of the lecture operates under the presumption you have a passing familiarity with three phase AC circuit analysis, motor starters, and have a basic understanding of electromagnetic interaction. If you had trouble calculating inrush in the previous examples, this half of the lecture is definitely off limits to you. Only the strongest, smartest, and sexiest among you may proceed. Assuming you're still with me, you'll no doubt recall that motors are devices that consume electrical power and produce rotating mechanical power via different types of electromagnetic interaction. One of these interactions is explained using the left-hand motor rule which specifies that a current carrying wire inside a magnetic field will experience a resultant force. This is the effect that turns the rotor. The second interaction is explained using the right-hand generator rule, 
which specifies that a wire moving in a magnetic field will experience induced current in a direction counter to the initiating current. This is known as counter electromotive force, or CEMF, which can be thought of as a variable voltage source in opposition to the applied voltage across a motor winding. Counter electromotive force is proportional to speed. The faster the motor is spinning, the more counter electromotive force is produced in opposition to applied voltage. This is the effect that explains inrushed. More appropriate, it is the lack of this effect that explains inrush. A motor at rest is not producing counter electromotive force, and upon closure of a full voltage starter, the winding experiences full voltage. Consider the simplified model of a squirrel cage induction motor winding consisting of several components, the first of which is a small variable resistance, which is meant to represent the losses inherent in a motor's operation. This could be resistance losses, core losses, sound losses, winding losses, bearing losses, or anything else that doesn't go towards usable power output. I'd like to say this component is small enough you could ignore it, but it isn't. Any power consumed by this component would be considered a loss. The second component is also a variable resistor, which is meant to represent the real power consumed by the winding. The third component is a variable inductor, which represents the reactive power consumed by the winding during operation. Both these components are representative of a motor's operational state and the speed torque curve. At certain points, the reactive portion could be greater than the real portion, and at other points, the real portion could be greater than the reactive portion. We'll examine real and reactive power and efficiency of motors at different points in the speed torque curve in other lectures. Finally, of direct importance to this particular lecture, the fourth component is a variable voltage source in opposition to applied voltage, and its magnitude is proportional to rotational speed, which represents the counter electromotive force produced as a result of generator action while the motor is in operation. At rest, counter electromotive force is zero. As the rotational speed increases, counter electromotive force increases. By the way, this is a mathematical model only, an extremely simple one at best. Do not expect to take apart a motor and find a variable resistor inductor and power supply in series of the winding. These components are a simple way of explaining the electrical phenomenon of a motor in operation. For the purposes of this lecture, let's just lump the two resistor portions into one variable resistance. Let's examine how rotational speed and the resultant counter electromotive force influence inrush current by way of an illustrated example. Consider a quarter horsepower rated motor designed to operate using light industrial three phase 120 volt line of neutral 208 volt line to line 60 hertz AC in a Y configuration. When operated at the rated speed of 1700 RPM, this motor is known to draw one amp of current. For the purposes of this lecture, let's assume this motor's windings at rest can be modeled as a variable resistance component of 15 ohms, a reactive component of 13 ohms, and at rest, the winding produces no counter electromotive force in opposition to applied voltage. The total impedance presented by each winding is a series combination of these elements with a value of roughly 19.8 ohms at an angle of 40.9 degrees. Upon closure of a full voltage starter, each winding would experience full voltage. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates each winding draws roughly 6 amps, lagging each phase by a relative 40.9 degrees. This is the inrush phenomenon. Each winding experiences full voltage because counter electromotive force does not exist with the motor at rest. A massive surge of current occurs because nothing opposes full voltage. Luckily, this phenomenon is temporary. After the inrush phenomenon occurs, the motor accelerates to the no load speed of let's say 1770 RPM. While doing so, not only do the real and reactive components change, so too does the counter electromotive force produced as a result of increased rotational speed. Let's say the winding at the no load speed can be modeled as a variable resistive component of 27 ohms, a reactive component of 66 ohms, and at 1770 RPM, the winding produces 70 volts of counter electromotive force in opposition to applied voltage. The total impedance presented by each winding is a series combination of these elements with a value of roughly 71.3 ohms at an angle of 67.8 degrees. With 120 volts pushing in one direction and 70 volts in another, each winding would experience a 50 volt differential. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates each winding would draw roughly 701.2 milliampers, lagging each phase by a relative 67.8 degrees. This is the current draws in the no load condition, a point on the speed torque curve where the speed is high but torque is zero. This results in an output of zero mechanical power. The no load current may be specified as NLA, no load amperes on a motor nameplate.
Let's say the motor is put to work and experienced some oppositional torque as it is being put to use either lifting, pushing, pulling, or pulverizing something. At the rated condition, the motor produces 1 newton meter of torque at 1,700 RPM. This is 185.3 watts of mechanical power, roughly equivalent to a quarter horsepower. At the rated condition, not only do the real and reactive components change, so too does the counter electromotive force produced as a result of decreased rotational speed. Let's say the winding at the rated condition can be modeled as a variable resistant component of 41 ohms, a reactive component of 34 ohms, and at the reduced rated speed of 1,700 RPM, the winding produces only 67 volts of counter electromotive force in opposition to applied voltage. The total impedance produced by each winding is a series combination of these elements, with a value of roughly 53.3 ohms at an angle of 39.7 degrees. With 120 volts pushing in one direction and 67 volts in another, each winding would experience a 53 volt differential. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates each winding draws 995 milliampers, roughly 1 amps, lagging each phase by a relative 39.7 degrees. Current increased, not only because the real and reactive components change at the rated condition, but also because the winding experiences less counter electromotive force at the lower rated speed. It is this same phenomenon that explains the increased current draw of increasingly overloaded motors. As rotational speed decreases, so too does the counter electromotive force in opposition to applied voltage. As a result, the motor draws more current. In summary, the current drawn by a motor is reflective of not only the magnitude of the real and reactive components at that specific operating condition on the speed torque curve, but also the amount of counter electromotive force experienced at that rotational speed. At higher rotational speeds, the winding experiences more counter electromotive force in opposition to applied voltage, at lower rotational speeds, less. At zero RPM, the winding experiences no counter electromotive force in opposition to applied voltage, and it is this phenomenon, above all others, that explains the intense but brief surge of current known as inrush. All right, before I let you go, let's take a quick look at some graphs of motors experiencing inrush. Here's a plot of current in yellow and rotational speed in blue as a function of time for an unloaded motor experiencing the closure of a full voltage starter. You note the unloaded motor experiences a massive surge of current, which quickly tapers off as rotational speed increases. Once rotational speed stabilizes at the no load speed of 1770 RPM, current draw stabilizes. After 30 or so cycles of 60 Hz AC, the inrush phenomenon is over. Now here's another plot of the same motor in a different scenario. In the first scenario, the motor was unloaded. In this second scenario, I'm using a dynamometer to apply a constant one newton meter of oppositional torque to the motor. This is meant to simulate some static load the motor needs to move at the start, like a pump or a loaded conveyor belt. You'll note that the inrush phenomenon occurs for a longer period of time, on the order of 60 or so cycles of 60 Hz AC, twice as long as the unloaded condition. Once rotational speed eventually stabilizes at the rated speed of 1700 RPM, current draw stabilizes at the rated current draw. This is meant to imply that the starting condition of the motor can affect inrush magnitude and duration. It's this same phenomenon that also explains why motors overload when they're single phased at standstill. If the rotating magnetic field is never established, the rotor doesn't move and no counter electromotive force is produced, and as a result, the motor experiences a sustained inrush condition. All right, that's about it for today. In summary, inrush, like college, is intense and painful, but thankfully it's brief. Don't burn out. It'll be over soon enough. In conclusion, the lecture examined inrush calculations using motor day and plate data and examined the electrical theory explaining inrush. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.